The Open Window by Saki. My aunt will be down presently, Mr. Nuttall, said a very self-possessed young lady of fifteen. In the meantime, you must try and put up with me. Frampton Nuttall endeavoured to say the correct something which should duly flatter the niece of the moment without unduly discounting the aunt that was to come. Privately, he doubted more than ever whether these formal visits on a succession of total strangers would do much towards helping the nerve cure which he was supposed to be undergoing. I know how it'll be, his sister had said when he's preparing to migrate to this rural retreat. You'll bury yourself down there and not speak to a living soul, and your nerves will be worse than ever from moping. I shall just give you letters of introduction to all the people I know there. Some of them, as far as I can remember, were quite nice. Frampton wondered whether Mrs. Sappleton, the lady to whom he was presenting one of the letters of introduction, came into the nice division. Do you know many of the people around here? asked the niece when she judged that they had had sufficient silent communion. Hardly a soul, said Frampton. My sister was staying here at the rectory, you know, some four years ago, and she gave me letters of introduction to some of the people here. He made the last statement in a tone of distinct regret. Then you know practically nothing about my aunt, pursued the self-possessed young lady. Only her name and address, admitted the caller. He was wondering whether Mrs. Sappleton was in the married or widowed state. An undefinable something about the room seemed to suggest masculine habitation. Her great tragedy happened just three years ago, said the child. That would be since your sister's time. Her tragedy? asked Frampton. Somehow in this restful country spot, tragedies seemed out of place. You may wonder why we keep that window wide open on an October afternoon, said the niece, indicating a large French window that opened onto a lawn. It is uh, quite warm for the time of the year, said Frampton, but has that window got anything to do with the tragedy? Out through that window, three years ago to a day, her husband and her two young brothers went off for their day shooting. They never came back. In crossing the moor to their favourite snipe-shooting ground, they were all three engulfed by a treacherous piece of bog. It had been that dreadful wet summer, you know, and places that were safe in other years gave way suddenly without warning. Her bodies were never recovered. That was the dreadful part of it. Here the child's voice lost its self-possessed note and became falteringly human. Poor, poor aunt always thinks that they will come back some day, they and the little brown spaniel that was lost with them, and walk in at that window just as they used to do. That is why the window is kept open every evening till it is quite dusk. Poor dear aunt. She has often told me how they went out. Her husband with his white waterproof coat over his arm, and Ronnie, her youngest brother, singing, Bertie, why do you bound? As he always did to tease her, because she said it got on her nerves. Do you know, sometimes on still quiet evenings like this, I almost get a, a creepy feeling that they will all walk in through that window. She broke off with a little shudder. It was a relief to Frampton when the aunt bustled into the room with a whirl of apologies for being late in making her appearance. I hope Vera has been amusing you, she said. She has been very interesting, said Frampton. I hope you don't mind the open window, said Mrs. Sappleton briskly. My husband and brothers will be home directly from shooting, and they always come in this way. They've been out for snipe in the marshes today, so they'll make a fine mess over my poor carpets. So like you menfolk, isn't it? She rattled on cheerfully about the shooting and the scarcity of birds and the prospects for duck in the winter to Frampton. It was all purely horrible. 
He made a desperate but only partially successful effort to turn the talk onto a less ghastly topic. He was conscious that his hostess was giving him only a fragment of her attention, and her eyes were constantly straying past him to the open window and the lawn beyond. It was certainly an unfortunate coincidence that he should have paid his visit on this tragic anniversary. The doctors agree in ordering me complete rest, an absence of mental excitement, and avoidance of anything in the nature of violent physical exercise, announced Frampton, who laboured under the tolerably widespread delusion that total strangers and chance acquaintances are hungry for the least detail of one's ailments and infirmities, their cause and cure. On the matter of diet, they are not so much in agreement, he continued. Uh, no, said Mrs. Sappleton in a voice which only replaced a yawn at the last moment. Then she suddenly brightened into alert attention, but not to what Frampton was saying. Here they are at last, she cried, just in time for tea, and don't they look as if they were muddy up to the eyes? Frampton shivered slightly and turned towards the niece with a look intended to convey sympathetic comprehension. The child was staring out through the open window with dazed horror in her eyes. In a chill shock of nameless fear, Frampton swung round in his seat and looked in the same direction. In the deepening twilight, three figures were walking across the lawn towards the window. They all carried guns under their arms and one of them was additionally burdened with a white coat hung over his shoulders. A tired brown spaniel kept close at their heels. Noiselessly they neared the house, and then a hoarse young voice chanted out of the dusk, I said, Bertie, why do you bound? Frampton grabbed wildly at his stick and hat. The hall door, the gravel drive, and the front gate were dimly noted stages in his headlong retreat. A cyclist coming along the road had to run into the hedge to avoid imminent collision. Here we are, my dear, said the bearer of the white Macintosh coming in through the window. Fairly muddy, but most of it's dry. Who was that who bolted out as we came up? A most extraordinary man, a Mr. Nuttall, said Mrs. Sappleton could only talk about his illnesses, and dashed off without a word of goodbye or apology when you arrived. One would think he had seen a ghost. I expect it was the Spaniel, said the niece calmly. He told me he had a horror of dogs. He was once hunted into a cemetery somewhere on the banks of the Ganges by a pack of pariah dogs, and had to spend the night in a newly dug grave, with the creatures snarling and grinning and foaming just above him. Enough to make anyone lose their nerve. Romance at short notice was her speciality. A Woman Seldom Found by William Sansom Once, a young man was on a visit to Rome. It was his first visit. He came from the country. But he was neither on the one hand so young, nor on the other so simple, as to imagine that a great and beautiful capital should hold out finer promises than anywhere else. He already knew that life was largely illusion, that though wonderful things could happen, nevertheless, many disappointments came in compensation. And he knew, too, that life could offer a quality even worse, the probability that nothing would happen at all. This was always more possible in a great city, intent on its own business. Thinking in this way, he stood on the Spanish steps and surveyed the momentous panorama stretched before him. He listened to the swelling hum of the evening traffic and watched as the lights went up against Rome's golden dusk. Shining automobiles slunk past the fountains and turned urgently into the bright Via Condotti. Neon red signs stabbed the shadows with invitation. The yellow windows of buses were packed with faces intent on going somewhere. Everyone in the city seemed intent on the evening's purpose. 
he alone had nothing to do. He felt himself the only person alone of everyone in the city. But searching for adventure never brought it, rather kept it away. Such a mood promised nothing. So the young man turned back up the steps, past the lovely church, and went on up the cobbled hill towards his hotel. Wine bars and food shops jostled with growing movement in those narrow streets. But out on the broad pavements of the Vittorio Veneto, under the trees mounting to the Borghese Gardens, the high world of Rome would be filling the most elegant cafes in Europe to enjoy with aperitifs the twilight. That would be the loneliest of all. So the young man kept to the quieter, older streets on his solitary errand home. In one such street, a pavement-less alley between old yellow houses, a street that in Rome might suddenly blossom into a secret piazza of fountain and baroque church, a grave, secluded treasure place. He noticed that he was alone, but for the single figure of a woman walking down the hill towards him. As she drew nearer, he saw that she was dressed with taste, that in her carriage was a soft Latin fire, that she walked for respect. Her face was veiled, but it was impossible to imagine that she would not be beautiful. Isolated thus with her, passing so near to her, and she symbolizing the adventure of which the evening was so empty, a greater melancholy gripped him. He felt wretched as the gutter, small, sunk, pitiful, so that he rounded his shoulders and lowered his eyes, but not before casting one furtive glance into hers. He was so shocked at what he saw that he paused. He stared, shocked, into her face. He had made no mistake. She was smiling. Also, she, too, had hesitated. He thought instantly, whore? But no, it was not that kind of smile. Though, as well, it was not without affection. And then, amazingly, she spoke. I... I know I shouldn't ask you, but it is such a beautiful evening. Perhaps you are alone, as alone as I am. She was very beautiful. He couldn't speak, but a growing elation gave him the power to smile, so that she continued, still hesitant, in no sense soliciting. I thought perhaps we could take a walk, an aperitif? At last, the young man achieved himself. Nothing, nothing would please me more. And the Veneto is only a minute up there. She smiled again. My home is just here. They walked in silence a few paces down the street to a turning that the young man had already passed. This she indicated. They walked to where the first humble houses ended in a kind of recess. In the recess was set the wall of a garden, and beyond it stood a large and elegant mansion. The woman, about whose face shone a curious glitter, something fused of the transparent pallor of fine skin, of grey but brilliant eyes, of dark eyebrows and hair of loosened black, inserted her key in the garden gate. They were greeted by a servant in velvet livery. In a large and exquisite salon, under chandeliers of fine glass, and before a moist green courtyard where water played, they were served with a frothy wine. They talked. The wine, iced in the warm Roman night, filled them with an inner warmth of exhilaration. But from time to time, the young man looked at her curiously. With her glances, with many subtle inflections of teeth and eyes, she was inducing an intimacy that suggested much. He felt that he must be careful. At length, he thought the best thing might be to thank her, somehow thus to root out whatever obligation might be in store. But here she interrupted him, first with a smile and then with a look of some sadness. She begged him to spare himself any perturbation. 
She knew it was strange that in such a situation he might suspect some second purpose, but the simple truth remained that she was lonely, and, this with a certain deference, something perhaps in him, perhaps in that moment of dusk in the street, had proved to her inescapably attractive. She had not been able to help herself. The possibility of a perfect encounter, a dream that years of disillusion would never quite kill, decided him. His elation rose beyond control. He believed her. And thereafter, the perfections compounded. At her invitation, they dined. Servants brought food of great delicacy, shellfish, fat bird flesh, soft fruits. And afterwards, they sat on a sofa near the courtyard where it was cool. Liqueurs were brought. The servants retired. A hush fell upon the house. They embraced. A little later, with no word, she took his arm and led him from the room. How deep a silence had fallen between them. The young man's heart beat fearfully. It might be heard, he felt, echoing in the hall whose marble they now crossed, sensed through his arm to hers. But such excitement rose now from certainty. Certainty that at such a moment, on such a charmed evening, nothing could go wrong. There was no need to speak. Together they mounted the great staircase. In her bedroom, to the picture of her framed by the bed curtains and dimly naked in a silken shift, he poured out his love. A love that was to be eternal, to be always perfect, as fabulous as this, their exquisite meeting. Softly, she spoke the return of his love. Nothing would ever go amiss. Nothing would ever come between them. And very gently, she drew back the bedclothes for him. But suddenly, at the moment when at last he lay beside her, when his lips were almost upon hers, he hesitated. Something was wrong? A flaw could be sensed? He listened, felt, and then saw the fault was his. Shaded, soft shaded lights by the bed, but he had been so careless as to leave on the bright electric chandelier in the centre of the ceiling. He remembered the switch was by the door. For a fraction, then, he hesitated. She raised her eyelids, saw his glance at the chandelier, understood. Her eyes glittered. She murmured, My beloved, don't worry. Don't move. And she reached out her hand. Her hand grew larger. Her arm grew longer and longer. It stretched out through the bed curtains, across the long carpet, huge and overshadowing the whole of the long room, until at last its giant fingers were at the door. With a terminal click, she switched out the light. <laughs>